Can we celebrate Jesus this morning? <laughs> glory, glory, glory. Let's stand together as we reverence the reading of his word. Welcome to the 1130 service. Let me first apologize for the jam. I went seven minutes over, and it created a situation out there on the parking lot. So that was on me, but thank the Lord for all those who serve and were a part of orchestrating how to get people out and get people in. You made it. Look at your neighbor and say, you made it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I also want to thank all the volunteers and staff that made Resurrection Celebration happen yesterday. It was the biggest ever to date. Over 8,000 showed up here yesterday. And just an amazing time in the Lord, so praise God, amen? amen? Matthew chapter 26, when you get there, if you would turn there, then when you get there, say amen. I'm going to have you multitask this morning, because we're going to read from Matthew 26, and then we're going to receive uh, communion after I read, and so I'll give you a chance to set your Bibles down and give you three things to write down today so you'll know when we're almost done when we get to that third thing three things to write down today the point of this week and the point of today on this resurrection Sunday <laughs> is to make sure everybody knows what this week is all about because it's easy to get covered up and I don't want it to get covered up and we not know what this week is all about it's Passover Jesus didn't just jot down some random day he gave himself over to be crucified at Passover. He was always in control. We're not looking back this week saying, man, Jesus, how could they have done that to you? No, it was all orchestrated. It was all planned by God. Jesus knew the plan. I'm going to show it to you right here in Matthew 26. And today we remember if you're in Matthew 26, say amen. amen. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll prepare your elements to receive communion. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. He knew it. He spoke it. He wasn't surprised by it. He's in control. Would he pray that if there's another way, let it happen? Yeah, in this same chapter. He said, Father, if it be possible that this cup pass from me, May it pass, but not my will, your will be done. When they came to arrest him, he said, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he uttered the words, I am. And every soldier fell backwards because they couldn't take him unless he gave himself. Jesus is who this word says he is. And this is a beautiful opportunity on this Resurrection Sunday for us just to look into his word and to see who he really is, not through the lens of a religion or tradition, but through the lens of his word and truth. In this same chapter, as you prepare your elements, you can set your Bibles down and grab the, the elements. We're going to remember the Lord today in communion. Yes. 
down in verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for this opportunity to remember Passover to remember your son Jesus who gave his life for our sins who you raised from the dead and your word says as often as we eat this bread to do so in remembrance of you so Lord Jesus we take this bread if you would open that clear wrapper it'll get you to the bread we break this bread in remembrance of you, Lord Jesus. Take and eat. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of of sins. Lord Jesus, we believe today that you loved us enough that you spilt your blood on our behalf to pay the price of our redemption. And you've said in your word, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And we believe today that by your blood we are redeemed. We do this today in remembrance of you. If you would open that foil layer, it'll get you to the cup. If you would, just look down in that cup. And it represents the blood of Jesus, the price of our sin. Take and drink. church said amen. amen oh hallelujah greet somebody near you and tell them that he is risen he is risen he is risen he is risen I'm going to read those two verses again then you can be seated and it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things say, uh, sayings he said to his disciples you know that after two days is the feast of Passover Everybody say Passover. Passover. And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. I pray for all who would be under the sound of my voice. I ask that you would bless our hearing, that by your Holy Spirit we would receive revelation knowledge, that you would give us wisdom, spiritual understanding, a conviction of truth, words of hope, words of faith, and above all, words of salvation. I ask, Father, that in this moment you speak through me words you'd have spoken, that your spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue, that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer, that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word that removes our burdens and destroys our yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated, we are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Greet somebody and take your seats this morning. Can y'all do me a favor? Look at your neighbor and say, let's do the preacher a favor. I need everybody to move to their right. If you got a seat to your right, move into it. We got folks standing in the corridors trying to get in. I want to squeeze every seat out. The Lord wants his house full. So just squeeze right, and we're going to get everybody in. We got folk in overflow on both campuses. We ran out of overflow at the 945 service. Some folk have been on Burke Coons for two hours. Can we welcome them in right now? We're glad that you're here. We're going to make room for you. We just freed up all kind of space. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Are you blessed to be in the assembly today? 
We're in Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to give you three words to write down today. The first one is Passover. If you're taking notes, write down the word Passover. I want to make sure we understand that when you hear the word Easter, it's common in our culture to hear of Easter Sunday. That word shows up in the King James Bible once, Acts chapter 12, verse 4. The, the word translated in Greek means Passover. We need to recognize that Easter is Passover. Because when we don't see that Easter Sunday is Passover, we miss all the beauty of what Jesus came to do. And I don't want anybody to miss it. So we want to understand that this week is all about Passover. Passover is a seven-day feast that God implemented in the book of Exodus chapter number 12. It was a feast that God called his children to observe every year. It was a seven-day feast. The feast of Passover included a total of three different observations that I'm going to share with you today. The first was the Passover lamb. We read before the prayer, I want to go back and revisit this in Matthew 26, where the Bible says in verse 1, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, you know that after two days is the feast of the what? Passover. And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Can I hear you say Passover one more time? We need to understand what happened when Jesus gave his life to be crucified. We need to understand why he was in the grave three days and three nights. We need to understand the resurrection so that when we hear Easter, we put it all together because there's a truth that the enemy doesn't want the world to have. And I, 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 I happen to think that if the world were using the right language, we might not hear as much about Easter as we do. I went to an app the other day to make an order, and it, and it gave me an opportunity to order an Easter gift card and it had a bunny rabbit and some eggs on it and I couldn't help but think that if it showed a lamb and was called Passover would the world participate it's like saying Merry Christmas versus Happy Holidays I don't know about you but I'm keeping Christ and Christmas come on somebody and I want you to understand that when you say Easter you're actually saying Passover and it gives weight it gives meaning the word Passover shows up in the Bible 28 times and only once in Acts chapter 4 in the King James Bible is the word Easter used. And that word still translate to the same original Greek word that means Passover. If you would, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. I want to go to the second chapter, Luke chapter number two. So in Matthew 26, when Jesus called his disciples together and gave what we call the Lord's Supper or communion, they were observing the Passover. The Passover. Jesus annually observed Passover. I want to show you the first place this is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter. When you get over there, just say amen. And we'll look at it down in verse number 40, which is speaking here of Jesus. Luke 2, verse 40. If you're there, say amen. Watch this. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. This is referring to the earthly uh, father, Joseph of Jesus, the mother of Jesus, Mary. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem to observe the feast of Passover. Verse 42. For when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So Jesus, we read from the beginning, was taught to observe Passover. But what's amazing to me is that right here in Luke chapter 2, verse 42, Jesus at the age of 12 is in the temple observing Passover. Now, let me call a timeout. We'll put a pause button on that. Let me talk for a minute about Passover. 
In Exodus chapter 12, it was the children of Israel's last night in Egypt. God was getting ready to bring them out of bondage after 400 years of captivity. And he sends Moses in to bring them out. And God said, I'm going to send 10 plagues upon Pharaoh. I'm going to force him to let you go. And on the last night when they were in uh, Egypt, God tells Moses to instruct the children of Israel, I want you to eat this certain meal tonight. I want it to include unleavened bread, and I want it to include the fruit of the vine. It was the Passover meal, also called the cedar meal. He said, also, I want you to sacrifice a lamb. And I want you to take the blood of that lamb, and I want you to put the blood of that lamb on the doorpost of your house. Because tonight, an angel called death is going to come through the land. And whenever that angel sees blood on the door, that angel has been instructed to say it, if you know it, Passover. And that's where we get the word Passover. The angel was to bring death to every house so that the firstborn of every house would die. But if you had faith in the blood of the lamb, then you could put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And when the, the angel of death came through the land and he saw the blood on the door, it signified death already took place there. Death has already been paid there. And the angel of death would pass over. That night, God redeemed the children of Israel through what we know of as the Passover. God instructs his children in Exodus chapter 12 to make this an annual observance, to take seven days out of every year to remember Passover. Down in verse 26 of Exodus chapter 12, God says this. He says, if your children ever ask, quote, what meaneth this? Let me stop right there for a minute. What meaneth this? Have you ever had your child ask you, what meaneth this? If your child asks you what meaneth this, please enroll them at Word of God Academy immediately because we need that spiritual anointing that must be on their life if they're saying words like, what meaneth this? But seriously, in Exodus 12, verse 26, Brother Jefferson, God said, if your children ask, and you got your, your children right here today, if your children ask, what meaneth this? He said, I want you to tell them the story of the lamb and that it was by the blood of the lamb that you were redeemed. That's how I brought you out. But the lamb that was offered in Egypt on the night of the first Passover was not the first time that a lamb was ever offered. No, if you back up to Genesis 3, you discover that God in Genesis 3, 21 offered a lamb for the sin of Adam and Eve. And the faith of that redemption was passed on to Abel. That's why in Genesis 4, Abel brings a sacrificed lamb to gain access to God. And God says, accept it. And Cain, his brother, brought fruits and vegetables. And God said, not accept it. One came by the blood, one came by works, the one that came by the blood was accepted. It was established that the lamb would be the substitute. So when God sacrificed that lamb in Genesis 3.21, that was Adam and Eve's substitute. Are y'all with me? It was so common and so known that when Abraham was asked of God under a test in Genesis 22 to offer his own son, now, God knew all along it wasn't going to happen, but Abraham didn't know. And so in Genesis 22, God said, I want you to take your own son, Abraham, the miracle son, the one you wasn't supposed to have, the one you and Sarah were too old to have, but the one I gave you, the one I told you about. I want you to take that miracle boy, and I want you to offer him on a mount that I'm going to tell you of. And in Genesis 22, when they went up to Mount in the region of Moriah, God pinpointed the right mount. It was the exact same location that Jesus was crucified. And when he got to that mount, and his son asked him, you know, he said, Son, don't worry. God will provide himself a lamb. Abraham had faith that when somebody's about to die, we look to a lamb because a lamb from the very beginning has been the substitute when it should have been me. Are you hear what I'm saying to you? And when he laid Isaac on that altar, 
and lifted up his knife to slay his own son. He and Isaac had to have enough faith that God would raise him from the dead. And, and that, that, that's what Hebrews eleven seventeen and Romans four seventeen tell us is that he just envisioned, okay, God, you're going to raise him from the dead. But his first confession was God will provide himself a lamb. And when he raised that knife toward his son on a wooden altar, a voice came out of heaven that said, Abraham, Abraham, don't touch the boy. Don't touch the boy. For now I know you fear me, seeing you've not withheld your own son from me. And Abraham looked, and behold, there was a lamb that was caught in a thorn bush. He had thorns around his head and Abraham took that lamb and offered it in the stead of his son so once again a lamb died to save somebody are y'all getting a picture yet hey when John first saw Jesus in John 129 and Jesus is walking down the street this is what he said now behold the lamb that takes away the sin of the world he said now there's the lamb think about the holidays that we Christians celebrate there's at least three we don't forget. Christmas, <laughs> Resurrection Sunday, Easter. You better know that third one, Mother's Day. <laughs> Am I right about it? Because without Mama, we might not have known Christ and might not have known the story behind him eggs. <laughs> Are you with me? Ryan, you with me down there? <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. But on Christmas, Jesus was found laying in a manger place for a lamb. The first people that found out he came were shepherds. That's fitting if the birth was a lamb. See, God was telling us from the start who he was. This is the lamb. You've been observing this annual feast called Passover. I'm about to bring you your final lamb. Every lamb ever offered was a picture of this one. See, when I was a kid, I thought Jesus died one day. And we commemorated it by calling it that day Good Friday. Anybody like me? I just thought that's what happened. They named Good Friday after the day Jesus died. Anybody, nobody, nobody like me? Don't be ashamed to raise your hand if you thought like me. Okay, 80 of y'all. Praise the Lord. I really did, brother. When I was a kid, I thought... That, that Good Friday was a day that we used to mark the day Jesus died. Then I got older, got in the Word, and got to putting it together with my math. Then wait a minute. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 40, that as Jonah was in the belly three days and three nights, so must Jesus be in the grave three days and three nights. And I got to thinking, ain't no way he died on Friday evening and was already up Saturday morning, and that'd be three days and three nights. But if you're going to give me the day off, Good Friday. When Passover is understood, then you start seeing it. Even here in Luke 2, where you thought, I forgot we are. <laughs> so Jesus is at the age of 12, and he's reached this um, uh, a, a commandment observant age where he is brought to the temple and will witness the process of Passover. That would be 200 plus thousand lambs offered at one time. That's how many were offered when Jesus was crucified. We're talking about a massive amount of people coming to Jerusalem to observe Passover. And so it, don't be so hard on Mary and Joseph on why they lost Jesus. You're talking about a couple hundred thousand people that were flooding this city and they get out the city and they assume Jesus is in the caravan at the age of 12 and they realize, wait a minute, we don't have Jesus. Can you imagine, Mary? I lost the Son of God. <laughs> but guess what the text goes on to show us? It says they found him in the temple after three days. Y'all oh, better come on now. They found him in the temple after three days. But for three days, where's Jesus? But for three days, where is he? Where could he be? For three days, we ain't seen him. Where's the last place you saw him? At Passover. Oh, look at that. Look at that. He's 12 years old. But we're getting a picture of what's going to happen when he's 33. 
Because at the age of 33, he's going to turn himself over and he's going to be taken and he's going to be crucified on a cross. And after he was taken down off that cross and laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, who loaned him the tomb for three days and three nights, where is Jesus? For three days and three nights, what has come of our Lord? And we know in the word that the disciples doubted whether or not he would live. They doubted, where is Jesus? But we had a foreshadowing of that at the age of 12. And when Mary and Joseph finally saw him in Luke chapter 2 after three days he said wish you not wish you not I must be about my father's business at the age of 12 he already knew why he came and here's what's so powerful is that the first recorded words of Jesus the first recorded words of Jesus happened at Passover I didn't say the first words. I said the first recorded words in the Bible happened at Passover. And what were the first recorded words of Jesus? I must be about my father's business. I'm on an assignment. At the age of 12, he knew he was on an assignment. And guess what? Before he died, he uttered seven statements on the cross. And the last statement that he uttered on the cross was to tell us die, or it is finished. First recorded words of Jesus, I must be about my father's business. When did he say it? In the temple. What day? Passover. Last recorded words of Jesus. What day is it? Passover. Where is he? On a cross. And what does he say? It is finished. What is finished? His father's business. He came to do the will of the father. What was the will of the father? To bear my sin. To bear your sin. That was the will of God for him. And he always knew it. Now real quickly, as fast as you can, get back to Matthew 26. I left out something. Tell your neighbor, he was always in control. Now, this is part two. You can go on YouTube and stream part one taken from Wednesday night because it got intense in here Wednesday night. All right, go back to Matthew 26. When you get over there, say amen. Give me a chance to catch my breath. Woo, glory to God. He is who the Word says he is. All right, I told you three things were right down. Number one, Passover. All right, you back in Matthew 26? All right, watch this. Verse 2 again. He says, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. He didn't say it might happen. He said it will happen. I'm not only telling you what's going to happen, I'm telling you when it's going to happen. It's going to happen at Passover. Why? Because that's when lambs were offered. And he's the lamb. But not just any lamb could be offered. There were at least 12 stipulations recorded in Exodus chapter 12 of what the lamb had to be. And one of those stipulations was it had to be spotless, without any blemish. It couldn't be some messed up lamb you wanted to get rid of anyway. <laughs> Kept biting you every time you tried to feed it. Like, you, you wait till the next Passover. I'm getting rid of yourself. My wife got this champion goat. She raises these amazing goats. And a few years back, she told me where she got this goat and this champion goat, champion bloodline from some renowned farm. And I couldn't wait to see the goat. His name was uh, 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 Valentino. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying to you? I said, with a name like Valentino, this man handling fitness. <laughs> Welcome the goat to the herd. So I went out to welcome the goat into the family. The goat come hobbling out the back of the trailer and only three legs worked. <laughs> he had a defect at birth, messing up one of his hind legs. Now you're laughing at Valentino, but he can walk on two legs. Yes, he can. Two legs. Four legs don't need but two. That's a man. <laughs> but when I first saw that goat, I said, there ain't no way this is no champion goat. But the power was in his bloodline. And by the way, we got all kind of offspring of Valentino. Don't let that third leg mess up fool you. (laughs) 
My point is, is that you might have had a, you might have had a three-legged lamb. You might have had a, a lamb that had issue and said, at, 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 at Passover, we'll get rid of this one. No, the priest would inspect it. But before they inspected it, the family was to inspect the lamb for four days. So you would bring the lamb in your house. That's where the manger comes in. And the kids would get attached to the lamb. Because Mary had a little lamb. She did. Jesus. You see it? I needed that bell out. Thank you, brother. And so four days, the lamb would be in the house. And they would inspect the lamb to be sure there wasn't anything defective about the lamb because the lamb had to be spotless. And so Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the back of a miniature donkey on Palm Sunday. And for four days, they challenge him with hard questions. For four days, they quiz him up and down. Finally, on the last day, when he's taken in by the priest and the Roman soldiers, the, 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 the inspection went all the way up to Pilate, where Pilate himself would inspect Jesus just to see, is this man really? guilty of anything and Pilate stood up in front of the whole congregation of all the people with a bowl of water and he said I can't find nothing wrong with this man and he washed his hands and said I am innocent of his blood and he gave the people an option choose Jesus or Barabbas Barabbas was a murderer a seditionist that doubtly was the one that was supposed to go on the cross with the two thieves But the people chose the murderer and put Jesus on the cross. I'm Barabbas. What I got to do? I'm Barabbas. That cross was meant for me. But now all my mess, I'm free. Why? Because the innocent one died in my place. Jesus took my place. Jesus took my place on that cross. Now you say, it should have been me. It should have been me. No, it should not have been you. It had it been me, it would have offered nothing because I'm not sinless. The lamb had to be spotless. And so for four days, they couldn't find anything wrong. And when they finally came to Jesus by night and took him, he said, I'm in the temple with you daily. Why didn't you take me then? I'm going to show you who's in control. Watch this in Matthew 26. Jesus said in verse 2, at Passover, the Son of Man is betrayed to be what? Crucified. Now watch at the same exact time in a different scene. Look at what happens at the exact same time in verse 3. Then assembled together the chief priest and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who is called Caiaphas. So all the hierarchy got together. Verse 4, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. Shreveport and Bozier campus, read verse, verse 4 out loud with me. Ready? Read. And consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. If you were watching a movie, there'd be this one scene. And in this one scene, there would be Jesus telling the disciples, in two days is Passover. I'm going to be crucified. And then if the camera switched to another scene, in the other scene, it was the high priest all getting together saying, we're going to kill him, but we're going to do it subtly, and he ain't going to know it. But they don't know why they saying that. He said, in two days, it's Passover, and I'm going to be crucified. He knew what they would do before they knew what they would do. They showed him the buildings of the temple. He said, tear this temple down, and in three days, I'll raise it up. They said, he's a madman. What you mean? It took a 40 years to build this temple. He said he's going to rebuild it in three days, but he referred to the body of his temple. In John chapter 3, speaking to Nicodemus, he said, you remember how Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, and everybody looked up at that serpent on a pole, and they were healed? So must the Son of Man be lifted up. From the very beginning, he was telling them that he was going to die. In John chapter 5, he said, you think you've heard something by what I'm saying to you now? I'm here to tell you that the hour is soon coming when I, will, when I will speak to the dead and they will hear my voice and get up. John chapter 5, Jesus was already telling them, I'm going to die but it won't be the end. Woo! 
Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. When they showed up to arrest Jesus, <laughs> oh man, when they showed up to arrest Jesus, where did I tell y'all to go? All right, let me get there. When they showed up to arrest Jesus, he said, this is your hour. This is your time. He permitted them to do what they were getting ready to do. And before he told them, this is your hour, he said this. He said, I was with you daily in the temple. You didn't take me into custody then. Because this is your hour. Even Judah, sitting at the table with the 12 on the night of Passover. And Jesus said, one of y'all tonight's going to betray me. Judas, who knew what he was plotting but didn't think it'd be that night, said, Lord, is it I? Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. And the Bible said Judas got up and left. If I know I'm plotting to betray Jesus, I ain't asking, is it I? He went so far to say, the one that dips his bread next in the cup will betray me. At that moment right now, I ain't hungry. <laughs> and yet he still dipped it. Because Jesus will always have what he says. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey. hey. He didn't just die on some random day. He's the Passover. Let me show this to you because it's going to set us up for number two. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll read it in verse number 7. He says, purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. Shreveport and Bossier, an overflow. Watch, watch this next statement. Read with me out loud. Ready? Read. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Read that part again. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Who is Jesus called right here? Our Passover. I can say and you can say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. I got a Passover. Death is passing over. Little boy standing outside the funeral home with his daddy mourning the loss of his mother and says, Daddy, I don't understand. And about that time, an 18-wheeler passed by that blocked the sun and a shadow came over them and the 18-wheeler went on down and the sun came back and the face shone in the light. The dad looked down at the boy and said, son, did you feel that shadow come over you as the 18-wheeler blocked the sun? He said, yeah, daddy. He said, did it hurt? He said, no, daddy. He said, that's all mama ever felt. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, because Jesus is my Passover, the closest a believer will ever get to death is his shadow. That's the best news you ever heard in your life. We forget sometimes that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Eternal life is the greatest gift of God. Eternal life is the greatest gift of God that I have eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15 puts it like this. The last enemy every believer will defeat is death. If you can defeat death, what else can you not defeat? No wonder that song resonated when we sang it this morning. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Why? Because when I pray, my God is not dead. Because when I pray, I'm not speaking to a dead statue. Because when I pray, I'm not speaking to a prophet that's laid in some tomb over in the Middle East. Because when I pray, the one I'm praying to sits at the right hand of God and he hears everything that I say. He's alive. And because he's alive, I can pray and be heard and know that he intercedes on my behalf. And I am not alone. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.
Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? There's a word here we got to pull out. It's in verse 7. It says, purge out therefore the old leaven. So if you would, write down this second word. Unleavened bread. The second day of Passover included the feast of unleavened bread. Actually, it started day one. It was the observance of unleavened bread. And what the children of Israel had to do is they had to go in the house and find any leaven and get it out. Couldn't no leaven be in the house. Now, that might just sound like foreign language right now. What is leaven? When God called the children of Israel out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12, he said, I want you to make some bread tonight, but don't make it with leaven. As a matter of fact, when you eat tonight, don't take your shoes off and make sure your laces are tied. He literally says this. He says, eat as one prepared for a journey. In other words, you're leaving after this meal. Don't put leaven in your bread because that's what makes it rise. And that's going to take too long. Bread without leaven looks more like a cracker, and you can bake it quick. God said, leaven's going to slow down what I'm doing tonight. And leaven represents sin in the old covenant. And what Galatians 5, 9 says about leaven is that even a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. Which means if you had a big lump of dough and you only put a little leaven in it, you can't unleaven the leaven of the dough. It'll, it'll work its way through that whole dough. And the whole dough will be leavened. And, you, and, and he said, you've got to get all the leaven out of the house. Even a little leaven, Galatians 5, 9 says, a leaven, a whole loaf. Y'all need another example? I like popcorn. Salted. But if you oversalt it, you can't unoversalt it. Because a little salt will salt the whole bucket. A little leaven, leaven a whole loaf. God said, I want the leaven out of your house because even a little bit of it will mess up the whole dough. Let me bring it on home. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, Even if you break the smallest commandment, even if you break the smallest little commandment of all laws, if you break the smallest one, you might as well have broken them all because there is no exemption in that you only had a little leaven. But us church folk are bad about compartmentalizing our sin. So you may have a little something over here that don't nobody know nothing about, but you think you're self-righteous because your stuff ain't out there in everybody's face. But just because I don't see your sin don't mean you don't have no sin. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And a little leaven will mess up the whole thing. So you might look good and you might talk good, but God knows what's in your closet and God knows what's in your past. And even beyond that, he knows what's in our heart. When Romans 3.23 says all have sinned, it means all have sinned. Romans 3.10 breaks it down and says there's none good, not one. There's none righteous, not one. So God said, I want you to see leaven as sin. Sin is leaven. It don't take no, I ain't never killed nobody. I think I'll go to heaven. Well, I ain't never cheated on my wife. I believe I'll go to heaven. But you looked at a woman with lust. Well, I ain't never killed nobody. But there was somebody you hated. You say, well, I ain't ever done nothing. But you wouldn't forgive people. Everybody. 
So leaven represents sin. So what Jesus did on that cross is he died for stuff that you see and that we don't see. He became a sin offering on that cross. And he is laid on that cross during Passover, specifically during the peace, the, 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 uh, the uh, feast of unleavened bread. He's laid in the tomb to, to commemorate the feast of unleavened bread. What? He's taken my sin. He's taken your sin. It was so heavy on Jesus that the Bible said from the time that they stretched him on that cross, heaven sin, earth rejected, they stretched him on that cross, and for three hours the sun went dark. And in complete darkness, Jesus said, Ele, Ele, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God had not forsaken him in that God had to turn his back on the sin that Jesus bore that was my sin and your sin. He took my, my mess. He took my, it was me. It was me that he bore that penalty for. Sometimes we need to get a, a revelation of what Jesus went through. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 19 says, when they got through beating him, when they got through beating him, that he was more marred than any man. The Bible goes on to say in Isaiah 52, and 53 that he was not even recognizable they plucked his beard from his face they took a mallet and drove thorns into his brow with a crown of thorns they beat him with a cat of nine tails stretched out between two poles When his body stretched and that whip coming across his back, it not only cut him, it ripped him. Psalm 22 says he looked down and saw his bones. Pierced in his hands and pierced in his feet. Isaiah 53, 1 says, this story is so horrific, who would believe it? When he says in verse 1 of Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report? Who hath believed our report? He was like a lamb. He was like a lamb led to a slaughter. And he opened not his mouth. Those Roman soldiers have never seen a victim like this. They've never seen one that just laid his arm down. Because they didn't take his life. He gave it. Who are we to judge another? Who are we to condemn? And we forget... The cross, we've lost our first love because that's where he showed his love. Greater love hath this than no man than to lay his life down for another. Jesus laid his life down for me. That's what the word love means. It means give. It means sacrifice. The first time the word was ever used was in Genesis 22. It's, it's a, it, love means I give, I surrender, I sacrifice. Love is giving, and Jesus loved me like nobody has never loved me. Do you understand? In the love that he has for me and the love that he has for you, a love you don't earn, a love we don't deserve, but a love that he offered. And the Bible says even the love we have for him is not that we loved him first, but that he loved us first. Right. And so it's just a few hours from sunset and a new day. And the high Sabbath is coming. Not Saturday Sabbath, the high Sabbath, the Passover is coming. And no bodies could be left on the cross. And so they took him down in great haste. Not even having enough time to anoint his body. They laid him in a linen cloth in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. That's why earlier, when Mary came to him and opened up that alabaster box and poured that oil over him, he said, she has done this for my burial. 
because he knew there wouldn't be enough time to anoint his body after crucifixion. And so when she anointed him while he was alive, she said, he said, she hath done this for my burial, already prophesying that I'm going to die, and this is my anointing. Why did the sister show up on Sunday morning at the crack of dawn to anoint his body? A body that was never anointed by the sisters because it had already been anointed by the alabaster box. Because when they got there, there were two witnesses outside the tomb said, you are seeking the living among the dead. He is not here. He is risen. <laughs> and when was this? This was the first day of the week. So write down word number three, first fruit. First fruit. First fruit was the third feast incorporated in Passover. Passover was a spring celebration that included Passover, which was a meal. It included the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where you took all leaven out of your house for seven days. And it included first fruit. Can y'all give me a few more minutes to explain first fruit? Just a little bit, all right? Just a little bit. First fruit was not a date of celebration. It was a day. Let me, let me explain what I'm talking about. You, if your birthday is on a certain date, that date might fall on different days each year, right? Passover was always the 14th day of the first month. Unleavened bread began the 15th. But God did something different in Leviticus 23. Now, y'all stay with me for a minute. I'm almost done. You don't want too much to get here to leave now. God did something different with first fruit. In, Le in Leviticus 23, God said, here's what I want you to do. During the seven-day celebration of Passover, the day after the weekly Sabbath, which is Sunday, I want you to make that day the celebration of first fruit. And I want you to go out, send the priest, go out and find the first fruit in the field, the sheave offering, the first one up. Now, all of them's not ripe yet. All of them's not ready to harvest yet. Just get one that's showing that the fruit is on. And I want you to take that fruit, and I want the priest to wave it unto the Lord. It's a first fruit offering. So let me bring it on home, southern folk. So you go out after you implanted your tomatoes, homegrown tomatoes, and you look on the tomato plant, and that little tomato, and you say, all right now, that's the first fruit. That's evidence that the plant is healthy. That's evidence that the plant is fruitful. That's evidence that the plant is alive. Now, I, I know now about that fruit. I better get back here and keep inspecting because more is coming. That's just the first fruit. So God said, on the, on the first day after the weekly Sabbath, during the week of Passover, I want you to make that day a celebration. And I want you to call that day the feast of first fruit. Go into your field and celebrate the first one ripe, the first one ready, and commit that to the Lord. Jesus, on the first day of the week, was risen from the dead. And when they went on the first day of the week, which was a Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. What was God saying? I gave you my son on Passover. He was put in the tomb during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but he was raised up on the Feast of First Fruit because he's not the only one I'm going to raise from the dead he's just the first one come on somebody you and I represent that harvest because he's the first fruit I know where my believing mama is right now because he was the first fruit I know where my believing daddy is right now if you have a loved one that you wept when they died but you know their faith was in Jesus you know where they are why because Jesus already defeated death hell sin and the grave to be the first fruit not the last fruit the first fruit Let me give you the scripture for this so you'll have it in your record. Let me give you the scripture of this. The first fruit. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. 
Colossians 1.18. He is the beginning and the first fruit from the dead. Mark 16.9. When Jesus was risen early upon the first day of the week. Oh, glory to God. In the book of Acts and through the epistles, guess when the church gathered? Guess when the church assembled? On the first day of the week. Why? They commemorated and they remembered that it was on the first day of the week that Jesus got up from the dead and we celebrate his resurrection not just once a year. We celebrate it on the first day of every week. That means no matter what last week held, this is a brand new day. Weeping may have endured for a night but joy always comes in the morning and think about every believer that joins the assembly on the first day and the first part of the day don't you tell me there ain't something to gather in the assembly on the first Sunday no the old timers knew the power of putting him first there is power when we gather together in his name oh hallelujah see preachers got it wrong when they say the Sabbath was moved no, the Sabbath is Saturday. That's a day of rest. The Sunday following is first fruit. And, and Romans eleven sixteen says, you ain't got to get it all right. If the first fruit be holy, the lump will be holy. If I could just give Jesus the first part of my day, my whole day is blessed. I give Jesus the first part of my week. The whole week is blessed. I put Jesus first when I get paid. The whole paycheck is blessed. You ain't hearing what a preacher's saying. There is power in the first fruit. Why do so many people gather on Resurrection Sunday because God is showing the world that there's still a remnant. God is showing the world that he's the first fruit. We, we, all, we all have this hope, I pray, that but because of Jesus, I might weep at the funeral, but I know I'll see him again. Because of Jesus, I know if I can defeat death, what about all these other enemies rearing their head in my life? Acts 20 verse 7 says, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Jesus said, Let me show you what I'm going to do. My friend Lazarus is dead. Let's go wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's just sleeping, then everything is okay. And Jesus said, no, he's dead. But I'm going to go raise him. And in John 11, they took him to Bethany and he tells Mary and Martha Lazarus' sisters he says take me where you laid him Jesus knew where he laid this is for the people and they said Lord this is the fourth day that means he's been dead three days three nights he just said, I know, that's, that's, that's why when you sent me word he was sick, I waited two more days. I couldn't come too early. He got outside that tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. The dead man got up. next one to die in the Gospels was Jesus. And 
Trevor said, I won't believe. I won't believe. If I put my fingers through the nail scars, I might believe, but I won't believe. And Jesus had already illustrated his power over death. He saved others they mocked on the cross, but himself he cannot save. When he told them, tear this temple down and in three days I'll raise it up. When they got there and the tomb was empty and them two men in white apparel spoke and said, you're seeking the living among the dead. He's not here. He's risen. With everything in me, I believe that was Elijah and, 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 that, was, and, 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 and that was Moses. I'm almost done. Jesus didn't ascend back to the Father immediately. He walked the earth counting the day of the resurrection. He walked the earth 50 days. I'm sorry, 40 days. then ascended back to the Father. And he said, I want y'all to wait right here. I'm sending some. I'm sending somebody. I've been telling you about him. And 10 days after Jesus ascended back to the Father was the day of Pentecost. Which the word Pentecost just means 50th. Because God instructed the children of Israel. This is so beautiful. God, this is so beautiful. God instructed the children of Israel on the feast of first fruit. When you get your first fruit. I want you to count it out 49 days. That would make 50 counting that day. And that's when your harvest is coming. And I want you to go back to Jerusalem again. And I want you to celebrate the harvest. And so they waited in the upper room for 10 days. And the sound of a rushing mighty worm wind filled the room and the Holy Spirit was sent not just some random time during the feast of harvest everything was strategic it fell on a feast and guess what happened all those people that came to celebrate the harvest heard the gospel Peter preached it in Acts 2 and 3 and 3,000 got baptized Wait, 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 wait before you applaud. Wait, wait, let me, let me say this. Make it applaud even louder. On Mount Sinai. On Mount Sinai, Moses. 50 days after they came out of Egypt. God gave the law. And when Moses was given the law, he told the people, don't touch this mount. It's holy. It's consecrated. 3,000 said, I wonder if it really is, and died. When God gave the law 50 days in the past, after Pass Passover first fruit in the Old Testament, 3,000 died by law. God said, let me show you the New Testament. Fifty days later, he sent the Holy Spirit. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And now he's moved from Mount Sinai into Mount you and I. And in him I live, and in him I move, and in him I have my very being. He lives in me. He walks with me. He talks with me. I can live. I can face tomorrow because he lives. I'm crucified with Christ. Nonetheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Let me pray with you this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray right now, Father, if there's one person here or in Bozier watching this telecast or live stream that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, let this be the day. Let this be the day. He is who he says he is.
Have you received your Passover? Have you received Jesus? If not, I want to pray a very simple prayer with you. And I invite everybody here in our Shreveport, Bossier campus, Overflow, watching live, watching this telecast, wherever you are. He'll meet with you right where you are. Romans 10, 9 says, if you shall believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Do you believe that he died for you? Do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Call on him. Call on him. Death will pass over. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I believe Jesus is the Passover. He is the Lamb of God. that takes away my sins. And I believe that Passover, he died on a cross for me. I receive your love for me. And I believe death could not hold him. And that you raised him from the dead. And that Jesus lives. That he is the resurrection. And the first fruit of them that believe. I believe. And I receive what you did for me. And I ask by your Holy Spirit that you would use my life to bring you glory. In Jesus' name. Now with every head bowed, just a moment. Do you believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead? Do you know that's why we're baptized? It's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And Romans 6, 4 says, we're buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. This coming Wednesday, if you want to be baptized, baptism class starts at 5.30. We'll baptize at 6.30. I want you to come. Follow Jesus in baptism. Don't be ashamed of what he did for you. Follow him. He was the first fruit. He's given you power. He's given me power. He's given us life. And no matter what it looks like, he's still the resurrection, even when the tomb is sealed. Do you believe? Do you believe? Can you say amen? Can we give the Lord Jesus a hand clap offering for his word? This glorious resurrection Sunday. All right, we're going to stand together. And uh, listen, Wednesday, baptisms. If you need to follow Jesus, come on forward. We want to see you here. Have a blessed Resurrection Sunday. If you need prayer, come forward on either campus. We have altar ministers down front ready to pray with you. I love you. Go tell somebody about Jesus today, all right? See you on Wednesday night.